Mark Smelly Bell here, and I'm dropping my running program for the Boston Marathon right now with my coach, Dan Garner. He and I came together and we worked this out and we got what's called Faster in 50. You guys may be aware that I released years ago Stronger in 30 Days. I did a bench program, a squat program, and a deadlift program. But now I'm giving you the program that you keep asking for. You guys are finally going to get it. And the good news is it's free. All you have to do is go over to withinyoubrand.com. Give us your email address and we will send it to you. So the program's here. It's for you guys. It gives you all the details on how I lifted throughout the entire marathon prep and how I ran throughout the entire marathon prep. Run through it. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. All right, everybody. I'm on another jaunt. We're about one month out. We are about one month out from the Boston Marathon. Start out real light jog. Something I've been kind of messing with. I kind of like to let the hands kind of flow a bit and just let them kind of shake out a little bit as I'm warming up. I think the hands and the arms are involved way more than we give them credit. And I've been talking a long time about, you saw me run with the WEC shakers and stuff like that. The pulsers and the pulsers teach you to kind of push down a little bit and let those hands bounce. So as I'm warming up, I like to remind myself of that. And one way to do it is just let the hands really flick. This is probably one of my favorite parts of the workout is just the warm up. So I just have zero expectations of it. And I just jog and walk. I start to feel like a small burn in the legs and then I just stop rather than like normal or if i'm running like really far far for me is anything over like 10 miles at this moment if i'm running like that then i have to just keep running right but in the beginning when i'm trying to get my lungs to open up trying to get my body acclimated to what i'm doing i just go and stop and start when i want sometimes this warm-up lasts six minutes sometimes it lasts two minutes Sometimes I might go about 30 minutes. It really depends on the day and depends on how I'm feeling. But I just pick it back up again and go as slow as I can. A couple running tips here in no particular order. Just get a slight, just a slight lean forward or almost pushing back of the hips. We want to move the elbow back. It's hard, hard for me to move the elbow back. All the years of pressing. Carl Lewis, thumb to the eye elbow to the sky <laughs> that's kind of what you're trying to do when you're when you're really running okay if you're jogging it's gonna probably be more in here so we want a slight lean forward we want the elbow back and you're just here like this we're going head over foot the heads going some people that have more narrow hips some people when they jog or run they run a very straight line so their foot is going under their head. But for me, with the wider stance and just kind of a wider, wider train tracks, I like to kind of do this head over foot action here. Small lean forward. And the last thing is to try to get your feet to travel back behind your knees. So as I go this way here, you can see the feet going behind. And again, because we're just warming up, I can kind of cruise around, pick up speed. I can slow down a bunch. I can cut this way, jump up on the curb, whoosh, <laughs> jump down, come back over. Just kind of run in a circle. The more that you play around in your warm up, the faster you get warmed up. Feels really good because it's kind of cold out. I'm going to jog back to my dad's house to take a leak. That's something that a fan made for me years ago. Wish I could remember who it was to give them their props, but I think that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. This is uh, when I went to Ohio State. I had a lot of great years there. It was fun being their fullback during their championship seasons. I'm kidding, I made that up. I just uh, happened to be able to sneak in for that day and somebody yelled at us soon after this photo was taken. My brother eating some steak. Looks good, he got in really good shape here. This is when he was coming out of recovery for alcohol addiction. And then there's my brother Mike who suffered from a lot of addiction and mental health issues. He's, uh, he died many, many years ago. And there he is 
running the football, running the rock. Hell's Bells photo from OVW, Ohio Valley Wrestling. That's me. That's my bro. That's Mad Dog. We actually, uh, we weren't a very good tag team. Because, <laughs> you know, he knew pro wrestling like the back of his hand. And I didn't know it very well. So, I was always kind of nervous. And I was always getting in trouble by him. And this right here, that was made by Quinn Bell. And if it looks familiar, that's the Within You brand logo. Because I think everything that you need is on the inside. I don't know if she saw it somewhere else or how she thought of it, but a tree growing out of a heart. I'm like, that's pretty cool. I think she did that when she was like eight or nine. Like, damn, that's a pretty sharp kid. I get a lot of beginners asking questions about running. They're trying to learn it. And it can be confusing to hear so many things online about cadence and these different techniques and stuff. And I'll just try to simplify it for you. If you haven't really run much in a long time, uh, you have to keep in mind, you're taking thousands of steps. Within these steps, there's a lot of jumps. So this is like literally thousands of times that you're getting this vertical displacement. So we need to kind of think about how we're gonna land with our feet, our toes, our heels, our arms. But again, real simple, just go from here, from walking, lean your head forward like you're going downhill, like this, and then get the arm swinging. Keep the chest up a bit so you can breathe nicely. I like to kind of go with almost a little bit of imaginary lat syndrome because I can expand the ribs, expand the lats, and breathe a little better. Just drive those elbows back. I think it's a good idea to practice and to play with trying to have your feet be like a little straight. Mine tend to want to kind of do this and then they loop around a bit. Like that's an exaggeration, but that's kind of what they do. So I try to be conscious of that from the hip a little bit because I want to move forward a lot. So lean forward, elbows back, head over foot. And now we just want a sustainable rhythm for however long you can keep it. But the key to back pain when you run, shin splints when you run, calf injuries, knee problems. To me, it's all the same. Try to find a way to mitigate some of the stressors. So don't run jog very slowly and walk when necessary most of these injuries i think are just from people trying to tough it out in the beginning don't tough it out work on being able to jog for two minutes straight then work on being able to jog for three minutes straight and so on so you get to about 20 minutes, you start to realize you can jog further and further and further very easily. Nice soft landings, a good bounce with the arms. You can actually heel strike. <clears throat> a heel strike actually will lengthen your stride. So if I'm, if I'm trying to walk fast, Walking is heel striking, right? Why can we walk and heel strike, but we're never supposed to do it when we run? Because with a walk, there's not a lot of vertical displacement. But if I keep this rhythm and I turn this into a run, and the stuff that I'm looking at isn't shaky as I'm going, then we're still good. So this looks like a grandpa run right here, but guess what? I could sustain this, this is a, a forever run. There's particular ways to run fast as fuck. There's particular ways to have a sustainable run. This is almost like, like a run downhill, right? How would I run, you're running downhill, 
you'd probably be in here and a lot of people like lean back, right? This is kind of not too different, just lean forward. I could toggle this speed so easily and so safely is the key. I know it might look a little weird or funny, but that's just the way it, way it be. And if you don't like heel striking, you can get more on the outside of your foot, ball of your foot. That's usually where I land anyway. So you can kind of be more like this. And I think another component to this is to just drive your feet back behind you a bit by grabbing the ground. Grab the ground, grab the ground, grab the ground, push it away. Push the ground away. Sometimes when I first start running, I like to kick it up a little bit. So I'm gonna pick up the speed a little bit and I'm gonna return to some nasal breathing. It's kind of nice to do real gradual with every exhale. Pick up a little bit. If I just think about pushing down and driving my feet to the ground, pushing down with my hands, <clears throat> head over foot, pushing my feet down. I can pick up some pretty good speed. Feels very safe. I feel in no danger. Got a half marathon this weekend, the Shamrock Run in Sacramento. That kind of marks one year of running for me. It's been nice, made a lot of progress, had a lot of great runs. Look, I'm heel striking everybody. Call the cops. It actually works out really nice. Feels really good. You heel strike, you roll, push off that big toe, turn a bit. I think you should be able to develop some different runs. Why not? Same side stride. Same side stride. Down the middle, heel strike. Now here we go, we're going uphill. Uphill is where you can really work side to side. Here, I'm pushing off to go that way with my right side. I'm pushing off to the left, left side, pushing off to my right. Boom, boom, boom. Movement without a lot of effort. Movement without effort. Can you see that sign over there? It says DMG Mori, DMG Mori. As I'm looking at that sign, 
It's not bouncing at all. I have total control because of the way I'm running. I'm not like jumping and pounding the fucking pavement. This way, like this, it, it goes in and out. If I focus and hone in on something, it's not shaking. It might be bouncing a bit, but it's not shaking. And that's what you want. You want to be able to control that. How do I control the force that which my body goes through on a downhill grade, an uphill grade, or even a flat? Because if we can minimize the bounce, we can fucking minimize everything. We minimize where all the stress comes from in the first place. So think about it. If I'm, on, if I'm on a bodybuilding stage and I go to go here, I go to flex and all that stuff. If I'm doing this, it taxes me like crazy. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look professional. And it also just is very wasteful in terms of your energy. So it doesn't matter if you're doing jujitsu, playing football, running, or anything else. There shouldn't be a lot, of, a lot of shakes in there. Maybe with a heavy power lift here and there, right? Like that's sometimes part of the game. But the less shakes that you have, even with that, shows us how you are able to handle the weight easier, which probably means you're stronger than the guy who tried to deadlift and it was shaking all over the place, right? So right now I'm focusing ahead, looking straight. Everything is bouncing, but nothing's skipping and nothing's shaking. If it starts to shake or skip, slow her down, run gentle. Boys and girls, there is absolutely nothing wrong with slowing her down. This right here, this was tranquilizing. This feels fucking good. Oh. Slowing down the heart rate, slowing down the effort in the eyes. We don't need this the whole time. Head forward, like makes it harder to breathe. By the way, do you guys know that the best way to swallow, and hey now, best way to swallow your supplements, your pills and stuff like that, if you take those things, is to tuck the chin down, not to lift it up. This narrows your airway. And when we bolster our head forward like this, and we're tired, and we're doing all this, it makes it harder to breathe. If you wanna kinda widen out that fascia around the back, keep that stretched out, keep that long, keep the head neutral, chin down, and the eyes up so you can breathe well. Head's not down either. We don't want this. This is a bad habit for me. I tend to do this a bunch. I wanna be here. And then we wanna relax. It's hard. It's not always easy to relax that face. You still might get like breathing faces because you could suck in more air by making a face, but still do your best to relax the rest of the system. Watch the top sprinters in the world. Their face is like yellow when they're running. So we're gonna go up this hill again. Hit this a couple times. Lean forward for those hills, side to side. Don't get caught in the middle, none of this. If you wanna kill your quads downhill, lean back. It will ignite the quads. Think you're better off, shoulders in line with the hips still, and right here. Sometimes the gradient of the hill 
it's gonna throw you off so much you gotta go sideways and stuff but this is pretty modest i'd say that running downhill is a sign of really really good health who can run downhill like a mofo little kids because their shit's still really healthy they're not all banged up so we're going to turn around and run the same fucking play this is really good exercise for me is to get these hills being 230 pounds and lugging myself up there is building some good resolve along with some strength and power in the hamstrings and calves so here we go I've always liked to prep my breathing for what I'm about to do. So I'll start breathing hard the way that I would breathe for the hill. Not hard, but with a little bit more intent, okay? So it's like this. Now we work on calming the breath down. How many people are you running by that are walking, running, cycling, scootering, that have their mouth open? Pay attention to it. You see some people out in there having a hard time of it. And there's some people that are just <laughs> It's on a little cruise. I like to switch back and forth for now because my capacity with nasal breathing only isn't great yet, but I'm working on it, trying to improve it. Right now, I'm probably about three miles away from my car, which is kind of nice because that means the workout is automatically a six miler, which is kind of cool. But then it does make me think how far am I gonna go on this trek today? So here's where we can slow it down a bunch. It's interesting with the hands and the arms, what you can do, you can keep them in tight, get a little bit of this going. But I find that after I've been running for a little bit, if I bring my, arm, my hands down by my hips kinda, that feels pretty good. Almost like I'm bowling from each side. Boom, boom, boom. Nice and light. The real key right here, I think, is the finesse of this. The accuracy. This is the, this is the Patrick Mahomes touch pass to Kelsey. That's what running is to me. It's, it's that guy. It's not that when he rips them, you know, Mahomes can fucking rip them, right? Throw the ball 60 yards, easy, 70 yards. Hey, hey. <laughs> uh, but running, it's not crazy like athletic necessarily, especially jogging but it's a finesse thing. How can a big guy move around like he's Lil, right? That's what we're trying to do. Move around like you're Lil. You start to move around too, shake things out, really loosen shit up. Pretend that shit's like busted. You know, maybe you gotta, like, how would you manage this guy? <laughs> it wouldn't be easy. But if you did it slow and steady, it wouldn't be too bad, right? Cause no harm. It's something the medical community, doctors and nurses are sworn to. Cause no harm. That's why they're always so careful and then maybe don't recommend what you'd like them to recommend because they're supposed to cause no harm. For fitness, you can think, what are the things I can do that are gonna make me better that won't cause any harm? 
Well, instead of a regular bench press, I can throw on a slingshot. Instead of doing full range close grip, I can bench press off of some boards or do a floor press. Instead of regular squats, which make my ass really sore, I can do box squats, partial range of motion squats, squats on the slant board with the kettlebell. Instead of deadlifts, maybe I can attack my back with reps rather than with weight. And maybe I could do partial range of motion with a trap bar deadlift or a rack pull. Still get the stimulus without the annihilation and without the fatigue of being like, oh my God, I'm trying to run and deadlift and squat. When you know how to manage those things and you go to run, you're running like this. Yesterday I ran six miles, did two podcasts and lifted with a 21 year old bodybone monster named Kenny Williams. And the day was like this. Got home, ate some food, felt fucking great. Fired up to do the same thing today. Get after it again. Why do people struggle with motivation? Why do people struggle with consistency? It's because they're fucking stupid. <laughs> when you have an opportunity to work, a lot of times you're, you're working, your intensity is too high or your frequency is too high or your overall amount of volume is too high or you can't stop lifting heavy. And then you wonder why on Thursday you're ready to fall flat on your face from a program that you started on Monday. Then you're off your diet by Friday. Saturday, you go out for some drinks. Sunday, you're recovering from it. And then you're talking about doing it on Monday again. Everything is a stressor. It's how you interpret that information and what you do with it. So why, when I go on the belt squat, why do I go like this with my reps? Is it because I love hearing people talk shit about how I'm not going deep enough? Or is it because I know something that maybe a lot, not a lot of other people know? Maybe I only know a lot of the conclusions that strength coaches and athletes have come to the long ass time ago that you can get the stimulus you can get the stimulation without the annihilation. And it's actually very easy to do that if you just give it some thought. Full range of motion stuff, do that with virtually no weight. Short range of motion stuff, load her up. Key to feeling great. This determinant of your success is your interest level. If you're on your phone until 12 o'clock, one o'clock in the morning while you're lying in bed, looking at that blue light, your interest level in losing weight is not where it needs to be. If you're doing that and you're not currently as strong as you want, you don't have the body you that you want, you don't have the money that you want, you're not as interested as you thought you were. Interest level is the key. If you're interested in it, you'll have a cascade of disciplines around it that surround it, that incubate it, that make sure that you get that fucking shit done every day. Otherwise, it shows that you don't care or that you only care on a scale of one to 10. I like a five or a six. That's okay, but just fucking admit it. That's why you're not motivated. That's why you're not fired up because you're not that motivated and fired up and excited and interested in the actual thing that you claim that you're interested in. You're not, you're just fucking not. <laughs> I am sorry to inform you. And I know this because I've done a lot of different diets. I've done a lot of different training cycles. I've done a lot of different cycles of a lot of different things. And I know that those aren't the biggest factors. The biggest factor is how into it are you? If you're into it, you're into it. And you're gonna do all the things that you need to do. Not that somebody on a higher level needs to do what you need to do. Because what you need to do versus what I need to do is different. I might have a list of 20 things that I need to do right now to get better at running. Somebody who's already proficient at running, who's been doing it for years, might only have a list of four. I can't sit around and worry about that. I got to still do my 20 things and they still have to be done every day if I'm that interested in it. How interested 
am I in running on a scale of one to 10? I'm a uh, five or a six, just to give it to you straight, because I got other shit in my life that I love. And so I'm not gonna sacrifice those things. I'm not gonna give up those things. I'm not gonna let it uh, bleed into the rest of the things I do in my life. I've done that with a sport already. And I loved it and that was fine. That worked good. <laughs> but I learned a lot from that. I learned that you can only spread your interest so far as well. There's only so much energy to go around. And that's when you start to feel fatigued and you're not motivated and you're not excited. Because your interest level and in other stuff is pulling you in different directions sometimes. Here we go, we got another hill. I wanna say one more thing about the interest level. You gotta keep in mind that people have been dealt the same cards as you and people have been dealt worse cards than you and they've done a better fucking job. They played their hand better than you have. Why is that? It's because they're more interested. The more you're interested, the more you'll really think about your strategy and the more that you'll actually follow through with all the strategy, all the strategy necessary to be good at something. A couple overpasses here in Davis. Kind of all we got <laughs> as far as hills go. Don't get caught in the middle, side to side. I can even shuffle my arms. What does this do? Pulls me side to side better. Hey, I thought we were going forward. <laughs> we are, this is a way to help and to catch, catching myself, catching myself. Catch, 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 catch. I think for multiple reasons, it's great to have a no tech day. So I don't have a phone with me, I don't have anything with me right now. No music, listening to my feet, listening to my heart. Feel everything. I'm running quite a bit faster than normal, which tends to happen when you don't have those devices. When you have those devices, you know, you look at them and you're like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be running at this pace, so I better slow down. So I like to zigzag between some of these cones up here. This is kind of fun. Just here, here, there's a bunch more up this way. Just gives you some turns on the feet. Changes the ankles a little bit. Takes your mind off actually running. You get to make up your own rules when you're doing this stuff. You can say every time I see a hill, I'm gonna run it hard. Or every time I see a hill, I'm gonna run it twice. Every time I see cones, I'm gonna dodge in and out of them. Every time I see one of these things, I'm gonna jump over it. You can turn this into a little bit of a game. You could do a little juke, bam. A little juke, bam. Pop <laughs> I probably ain't faking anybody out, but it feels fun. Remember, relax the body. We've been running for a bit now. Difficulty level starts to get a little higher, but the best thing we can do is relax, switch up the stride. Don't be afraid to do something that kind of calls to you. Right now, I feel like it's a good idea for me to relax my legs, stretch them a bit. Only took a couple seconds and we're right back to it. Slow, slow. Relax. Can you handle doing this for four hours or five hours? That's what this is about until I can run it faster. <laughs> That's where I'm at with a marathon. It takes somewhere between four and five hours. I think four hours means that you run like a 10 minute mile pace. So I'm not there yet and I'm also, um, I mean, I can run 10 minute mile pace, it's pretty good. But uh, 
for like eight miles or something probably maybe 15 or i don't know so, you know i could do it pretty good for a little bit but i'm also when i'm going to do the boston marathon i have no intentions of even trying to run fast it's not even gonna most of it's going to be like this i want to see if i can handle a lot of nasal breathing so i have a lot in the tank and my main goal is just to finish strong so the first 20 miles aren't really of any concern to me. I don't really care about them much. I'm gonna run up this little mini hill here and run that hill one more time. And then head back to my car. But yeah, Boston Marathon, that's the strategy. It's just to do what Rocky did in Rocky won. Go the distance. Probably of no surprise to people that Rocky is one of my favorite movies ever. <laughs> I just love in Rocky one, you know, it's not even necessarily about beating Apollo Creed and winning a victory for Rocky because he kind of considers himself, you know, not the greatest fighter. He just wants to prove what he says to Adrian. I just want to prove I'm not just another bum from the neighborhood. And he just wants to go the distance with Creed. And ultimately that's what he did. He went the distance. That's all I'm looking to do in that Boston Marathon is to be able to travel that distance, traverse that dis distance, to, to be able to make it all the way through. Follow through. Embrace your fears and follow through with your dreams. And that's my dream for right now is to just make it through the Boston Marathon. Kaboom. Turn back around. So I'm looking at pole line right there. Make sure it's not bouncing. There's a slight bounce, but there's no, there's no jiggle to it. It's almost like I'm trying to steady cam my eyes, steady cam the body. Again, that's to help with the impact of every step. If I go head over foot, that helps. If I have a nice clean stride that doesn't break anywhere, that helps a lot too. And I just gotta be real careful with how I place my feet down. When you're doing your nasal breathing, you can still utilize the mouth here and there. So this is like, it's just an adjustment period. You don't need to force anything too crazy. But I think that you want your nasal breathing to sound a little bit like you're blowing up a basketball. So as you're going, it might be like this. My tongue is to the roof of my mouth. My teeth are either slightly touching each other or slightly open, the mouth closed. The nasal breathing over time will just help you to get fitter faster, in my opinion. You can listen to some stuff from Patrick McEwen, Oxygen Advantage. There's also James Nestor. They talk about this kind of stuff quite a bit. Brian McKenzie, they have like tons of reasons how you actually are utilizing a different energy system. Sometimes from building your capacity to breathe through the nose. So for me, it's just been really helpful. I think sometimes people think it's a gimmick. They see me with the hostage shape and they just think whatever about it but I'm just trying to give people tools, give them more stuff that they can try to help take their training to the next level. Over the last uh, handful of days, I've been doing a little bit of mobility stuff on top of the mile faster release to get my legs to relax a bit. They're just super tight a lot of times and I'll still run into leg cramps here and there. So don't want that to be a limiting factor. Hoping that'll help. I already hit the hydration pretty good. 
Um, today I didn't bring any water, kind of on purpose, because I think it's good to train in different states. So, but for the most part, the water's good, salt's good, the magnesium's good. I just had leg cramps since I was a kid. And uh, I just think some of the truth of it too, I just never really been in that good of shape. <laughs> to be totally honest, I don't think my legs have ever been conditioned to do some of the, stat, the tasks that I've asked my body to do over the years. They've all been pretty extreme. <laughs> so, after heavy squat sessions, I would get leg cramps. After long runs, I still get them sometimes. They've been reduced a lot, but still run into that here and there. So I'm hoping that your myofascial release will help get the circulation there. I'm doing myofascial release and stretching, and I'm hoping that the combination of the two will just help get better circulation and nutrients to some of the areas that have been problematic for me in the past. Don't want any limiting factors. Try to eliminate or reduce all of them. One thing about making sure you're going slow, there's less to worry about in terms of your form falling apart because you were never producing that much force anyway. So if you go low and slow the whole way, you'll actually go much faster than someone that's trying to go fast that can't sustain that speed and they have to stop frequently or they just run into errors and problems or they have to, uh, they can't even finish the race. So it's all stuff to keep in mind. You gotta find a pace that you can maintain for a long ass time. I'll tell you a little story. I was on a flight one time and uh, when I landed at my destination, I had to take a bus to go to the baggage claim. And uh, I went to sit on the bus, find a seat on the bus, and most of the seats were taken. And the guy goes, hey, you can sit right here. And there was kind of like one seat left. And I was like, I know that guy. That guy was Bones Jones. And I'm like, hey, how's it going, you know? He's like, pretty good. This is when he was like in between a lot of his fights. This is about four years ago. So we got talking a bit. He was nice enough to give me his number. We knew similar people and stuff. And he was texting me about wanting to gain weight and go up weight class. And I already know his coach, his trainer, Jordan Chavez. I had him on the Chavez. I had him on my show recently on my podcast just asking him some questions on how he trained the champ and they do some power lifting stuff so Jordan's been a fan of mine for a long time and so that's kind of how Bones knew who I was but anyway Bones wanted to gain weight and he's like you know how to do this and I was like yep I know a lot of strategies to bulk but I'm not really I'm not really that kind of coach I don't really coach people individually like that. And so I said, let me send you over to my buddy, Stan Efforting. And so it worked out and uh, Rhino and him teamed up and uh, Bones got on the vertical diet, follows it somewhat, eats his fuck ton of calories and goes up a weight class. And then three years later he dominates but the reason why I set him up with Stan was because, A, I know how meticulous Stan efforting is. When that guy sets his mind to something, it's gonna happen. Stan's a world champion, a record holder in powerlifting, and a former pro bodybuilder as well. So I knew he would be meticulous enough with bones where he could really help and assist him, and not only help him gain weight, but to help him be functional for the job that Bones needs to do. Now, we didn't get to see that against Cyril Gaon 
his bones to come out in like 90 seconds or something. But hopefully in future fights, when he fights Stipe and whoever else he fights, hopefully we'll get to see more demonstrations of that. But I knew that Stan would have a great prowess with that because Stan also trained Hapthor Bjornsson for some of his strongman stuff. And that guy was pushing like 460 pounds body weight and throwing around stones and deadlifting 1,100 pounds. And now he's going after the all-time powerlifting record. I'm not sure if he still works with Stan, but anyway, that's kind of a cool thing for me to be able to impact a lot of you. But then also it's really a wonderful thing to be able to impact in any small way that I did, the GOAT, the greatest of all time MMA, MMA fighter. And Bones called me about two weeks, three weeks before the fight. And he was just grateful. I was going to bed, I was in my, in my bed, getting ready for bed. And uh, just sat down on the side of the bed and I saw a call from Bones Jones. So my work, wife heard it too. And he was like, man, I'm just grateful that you're in my corner and on my side and because I check in with them a lot, I send them stuff. I think it's pretty lonely for a lot of those guys that are at the top. So many of those people that I know, I try to check in with them because I can only imagine what it would be like to be that high level, to be like John Jones or John Cena or Stone Cold or any of those guys got to be confusing sometimes but anyway congrats to Stan Efferding and Bones Jones and his trainer Jordan Chavez uh, for an incredible incredible showing so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the lower back a lot of people are run kind of in this overextended position you put some stress on the back. Just put simply, just tuck those hips under you a bit more. Just take your bucket, your ass, and have it go like that a bit. They kind of say you don't want anything pouring out of the front of the bucket, which is your pelvis kind of, okay? And we don't want to be so far hunched over this way either but just pull the rib cage down just a bit and pull that belly button in and down a little bit towards the spine the chest is still up so you can breathe well that will really not going to fix your back but it helps to mitigate a lot of stress and also you do that throughout the day and you notice that when you pull your tailbone kind of down and in just from standing that it's kind of an amazing stretch for your lower back without even really moving. But it really shouldn't be a stretch. But it feels like a stretch because your back's in such tension because you're Mr. Overextension Pants all the time. Sticking out that booty like you're doing it for Instagram. And we don't want that. We want the hips more neutral. Booyah! He is done. Now we get out of these weird springy shoes. If I'm a regular shoes, walk a lap, and then choo, head on out of here. So a little, little walk. I think the kind of nice thing about a, a cool down is that you um, get to kind of ride out some of that zone two cardio that you were just doing. And it's a little bit of a hack, but you can, um, if you have access to a sauna, when you're done training, you know, make sure you get your hydration. But you can hang out in a sauna and extend out your zone two cardio a bit too. Because the sauna will keep your heart rate up a bit. So a lot of ways to gently do this. I'm sure you could also <laughs> go on an incline on a treadmill. If you wanted to safely get in a little bit of the same breathing that you may have been experiencing with running. If you are getting better conditioned at running, you can walk up, you know, a little bit of a hill. Um, outside or on a treadmill keep that same 
zone two heart rate threshold or a similar one and a similar breathing pattern to as when you were running, but less wear and tear on the ankles. You can also do the same thing on some sort of exercise bike and you're really reducing and mitigating the stress on the legs. Something I wanted to mention when I was running is that how do we, how do we reduce the stress of our landings? You know, because we're landing each time when we're running, each time we land, we're landing on one foot. That's the difference between a walk and a jog, right? But what if, what if we try to really be really gentle and really light? And what if we see if we can almost have both feet down or have the feet leave the ground for minimal time? And this is not, I'm not talking about advanced running. I'm talking about slow, light jogging. So maybe that, if I'm trying to really keep the stress level low, I don't want to go vertical too much because I'm going to be jarring into the ground. So instead of that, maybe I'm more here. Nice and easy. And maybe even I'm letting the heel hit the ground a bit and I'm rolling forward. This might not be the way to run the fastest, but it, it might be a way for you to run fast for a really, really, really long time because it's sustainable. So you get that foot about here, the knee's gonna be slightly bent and you're here and here and here and here. This pace is so slow and controlled that I could toggle back and forth between a faster run and a light jog. You know, what if I just had a cramp? Or <laughs> what if I just did a hill and I'm a little wiped out? Well, now I can kind of go back in here and stay in this kind of safe zone, catch my breath, and then reestablish that speed again, right? I think it's good to just develop different skill sets and even something like jogging slow is kind of part of that skill set. The other thing too, for a, new, for a new runner, you might want to just develop the ability to walk fast too because what if you walk, let's say, um, say you walk eight times and you walk for about you know 30 to 45 seconds. That's a handful of minutes that you're walking during your marathon, but if you're, if you're able to kind of walk pretty quick, maybe it just doesn't, I, hopefully you guys are following along with what I'm saying here. What I'm trying to say is that, like if it takes you four, four hours and 15 minutes versus four hours and 30 minutes, it's just not that big of a deal because you're still just getting started. And it doesn't matter the time that you can get, it matters what what is, recoverable what can you recover from so when you go and do a marathon does it completely wipe you out and kill you or are you able to do it and then get back into training soon after a lot of people i know that have done marathons it's very difficult for them to get back into training so i don't think i don't even think that your race day should be top capacity <laughs> i think that your training should be difficult and you shouldn't touch top capacities in training, maybe at all. And if you're new and you're going to these races, I think they should be done at like 85%. Because to me, 85% gives you a lot of wiggle room to recover from, the, from that particular day. That day is just a little extra than a workout. Then as you do it longer, that's when you can push hard and that's when you get your body more familiar with, like what does my body know about pushing at 85% for four hours as it pertains to running. Nothing. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. So why not have that be the goal? That's what the goal is. The expectations are low. I think too many people's expectations are too high. I actually think that this is the formulation of all the anxiety in this country right now. People, their expectations are high but their follow through is low. This doesn't make any sense. Since your, 
follow through fucking sucks, your expectations should be none. <laughs> but you're trying to live up to this standard that's not even real because you haven't even put in the work yet to really do the thing that you're talking about. And you're too new at it. You're too new at jujitsu. You're too new at your job. You're too new at... You haven't been studying it long enough. You haven't read enough books. You haven't been to enough seminars yet. What does your body currently know about going 90% at the thing that you're doing right now for a year, two years, three years? Maybe it doesn't know anything about it yet because maybe you just haven't been doing it that long. I've only been running for a year. What do I know about pushing really, really hard with running day in and day out for really prolonged periods of time? Not a whole lot yet. I know a little bit. I know a little bit. <clears throat> but I, I, what do I know about lifting when it comes to that regard? I know a lot. I've experienced a lot. I've been around a lot. I've seen a lot. I know a lot of other lifters. I, I have an idea of how everyone trains. I know how I trained. I know the different systems that are out there. So when it comes to that, I know a lot about that. And if I was to go back into lifting, I would be able to get myself to be able to push into some stronger intensities and higher percentages of what I would normally be able to handle in other things that I don't know anything about. I'd be able to handle that pressure. But I think most people can't, can barely handle the pressure of one like six hour day of work. I've, have a, I've had a business, I've had a few businesses now for over a decade. And it is really, really rare for people to actually work 40 hour work weeks. And on the employee side, employees are like, fuck yeah, I know what the guy's talking about because I work 60 hours. <laughs> but on an employer standpoint, you're like, well, this motherfucker's got to go to the dentist. This guy's got to bring his kid to piano class. This person has to do this. This person has to do that. And you kind of notice a shuffling. Not that it matters really, but I think that we feel like we're working way, um, good morning. <laughs> we're working way, way harder than we, we're working way harder than we think. And it's not necessarily that we're working hard. It's not necessarily that we're not working hard. It's that we're not efficient and we're not effective yet at what it is we're doing. Get more efficient, get more effective at it, then you can push more into it. And that's why I'm so excited about running because I'm only scratching the surface so far. What I'm trying to think about is where am I gonna be at in three years with this? Where am I gonna be at in five years with this? <laughs> the same thing goes for, hello. The same thing goes for something like jujitsu. You know, I'd like to do some jujitsu when I'm done with the Boston Marathon. Uh, how long I'm going to do it for, I, I don't know because I don't know yet what my interest level in jujitsu will be. But if the intro interest level is there, my goal would be to have it be something that sticks around for a long time. And so in consideration of that, I was planning on trying to figure out a way where I can do it nearly every day for maybe like two, three months, which sounds like the kiss of death. But when you plan, that doesn't mean that I'm planning on doing two hour classes every day. Um, I'm gonna have to pace myself for it, right? I'll have to see what I can handle. I'll have to talk to a coach. My goal is to do some private lessons for a while and then get into some classes just because uh, I don't have any grappling background at all. And I think I need to understand some of the general things involved with jujitsu. And uh, even though I took some classes before and stuff like that, I don't know much about it. So where are my expectations for it gonna be? They're gonna be nowhere. They're gonna be low. Keep your expectations low and wherever you can, just don't have any expectations at all. Or you can also reinterpret your expectations for things and how you interpret your results in comparison to your expectations going in. But most of the time what you'll find, nearly 100% of the time when you go into something with expectations, you end up being disappointed. So the way to stop being disappointed is to stop having expectations. How do you stop having expectations? 
chill the fuck out. You let things take time. Things take time. They take a long time. Everything I do takes time. All the lifting, all the running, all these things, they all just, they take time. And I'm in a fortunate spot in my life where I'm okay with taking my time with stuff. I'm okay with running for two hours. I'm okay with lifting for two hours. I'm okay with taking my time talking to people, interviewing them for the podcast. There's no rush. I don't have a rush. I don't care if the podcast is three hours. I don't care if no one listens to it after, after the first hour. Because I know that sometimes the little nuggets and the little things that we need, they just take a long time. And the, the real nugget, the real thing that someone says that might be the most powerful thing might be two hours into it. Just kind of the way it goes. Anyway, another successful run. I'm fired up for my half marathon this weekend. And the Boston Marathon is right around the corner. <laughs> you guys have been asking for a program. The program with Dan Garner and myself, we came together to give you guys an amazing program. It, it details my training a lot. We weren't sure if we were going to give you kind of the full thing or if we are going to kind of give you some half version of it because uh, I started to be able to handle a good amount of, of training volume. But uh, if you can tackle this training program, uh, then, then, uh, then be, be more than welcome to have at it. I'm really proud of it. You guys are going to be excited for it. You can get it over at withinyoubrand.com. In addition to that, you can only get Within You Brand products right now at withinyoubrand.com. We pulled everything off of Mark Bell Slingshot because Within You Brand is its own separate entity, its own separate company. The steak shakes are flying off the shelves. We got a bunch of new flavors coming in. So be looking for that as well. But the Boston Marathon program that Dan Garner wrote for me, you can go check that out right now and you can enjoy getting those gains with the lifting and the running. Strength is never weakness, weakness never strength. Catch you guys later.